Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. Hope y'all are doing well. And today we've got a really special Warforge video. Uh, I figured it was time for like a check-in. Uh, and I love doing kind of meta talks and stuff like that. That has always been one of my favorite parts of games is thinking about the kind of like rock, paper, scissors stuff to card games. Um, and it's something I've done in other videos with other games as well. Um, and so I figured we would do that today. And uh, we had a really helpful person, you know, make a tier list. So I'll flip over to that in a second. Um, it's a little hard to see, so I'm going to kind of like flip back and forth so we have a good sense of what all these warlords do. But this is a warlord tier list created by Corentin. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, looks great. You know, you're able to get the the images for all the um, the warlords. And so there's a little sneak preview there of what I think, but I don't want us to get too caught up there. So before we get into everything. Uh, appreciate all the likes, the comments, subscribes, uh, the Necron video. I think people seem to enjoy. Um, and it was really great that people stopped by and, and check that out. Um, I had a lot of fun with it. I really hope I can get some more Necron warlords because I do find them to be really interesting. Um, but for now, you know, we're filling out what we can, making decks as we can. Um, and I wanted to kind of bring some of my thoughts about the different warlords and kind of the, the different factions, I would say, overall kind of where I would rank them uh, in power level. So we're, we're kind of doing two things today. We're talking about like individual like warlord strength um, and obviously drawbacks as well. And then we're also kind of generally talking about like the card pool for each faction. Uh, because as you might see when we go through it, right, um, there's even uh, Carrington like added a, a, a part of the bottom that says like not good but carried by card pool. Um, I decided to categorize that a little bit differently, but we have to talk about, you know, warlords that without certain great cards at their disposal, you know, maybe aren't that good. Um, but for now, maybe they're, they're good enough and maybe what you should be playing. Um, there's not a lot in terms of like competitiveness right now, right? Like there's still getting alpha keys out to people. You can stop queuing against bots, but like the queue timers are going to be a bit long. Um, so it's hard to say like, you know, uh, okay, I need to make this deck to be the best. And, but I think I wanted to share my thoughts on like generally how things are shaking out um, and when this moves into beta or release or however they're going to do it. Um, you know, I think people are going to want to know like, okay, what should I kind of have my eyes out for? Uh, so that's really what we're doing today so i feel like let's just start at the top of the list we'll work our way down and uh just appreciate you sticking with me definitely feel free to give me feedback on the video as always and just uh appreciate y'all showing your support for all the warp forge good stuff that we got coming um all right so the first one and i think the one that i ranked uh the highest like pretty quickly because i did have to think about some of them um, I think it is no secret in the Warp Forge Discord and general community that Eldar cards are strong. They have the highest win rate in demo. They've probably maintained a pretty good rate uh, when I played against it with it uh, in the alpha. And uh, they also received the most nerfs. So it was clear that on power level they were higher. Um, I still would say that generally their card pool is pretty strong um, and I think there is one warlord to me that stands out amongst all three and that's Anvir Keltok. I have only played against this I don't have him unfortunately I really would love to to be able to kind of like play test who I think is you know one of the two strongest uh, warlords but I'll just kind of explain, like referencing, especially Madrail Galen, who is the Eldar that you get to start out with, like why I think Keltok is strictly better. Um, not in every scenario, but I would just say when I do tier lists, here, I will just visually show y'all. The way I think about it is leftmost is kind of what I feel is the most powerful and the most consistent, right? So like we're talking power level of cards and we're talking is your strategy able to be deployed consistently, which obviously gives you a higher probably win percentage uh, because your deck is just more consistently strong. Um, and so as you get to the right and as you move down, basically what I'm saying is less powerful, less consistent. 
Um, that's that's generally how I like to handle tier, tier lists, just to kind of give a bit of my thought process before we get going. So, what does Anvir do, right? So, Path of the Seer, two energy, right? You start with two energy on your first turn. So, obviously, you can just slam it, you know, as soon as you start. And it says, choose a card in your hand, return it to your deck, draw a card. Now, generally, especially coming from a magic background, when you look at a card like this, you would say, okay, I would rather draw a card first and then decide what to put back, right? That would be strictly better because you get perfect information. You see both cards, you make the decision. Now, here, you have to choose a card in your hand to return to your deck and then draw a card but then there's a really important point, which is gain a spirit stone. So this is essentially like card parity, right? You're putting a card back and you're drawing a card. But it's technically not card parity because you're getting, I would count waste stones as like half a card. Um, or, or I guess something in there. For those of you who play Magic the Gathering, uh, sometimes when you think about scrying, right? You're not drawing a card, but you're also not not getting a card, right? You You do get some advantage. So... Um, and waste stones, as you might know, for those who are familiar with Eldar, are just very helpful. It's a very helpful resource that enables them to really go over the top in power level of probably every faction. So the reason I like putting Anvir, let's just say one-to-one -one comparison, over Madrell Galen, which does something similar, right? It's two energy. You get to make a Storm Guardian. That's a two-one that has Shuriken and waste stone. So essentially, you, you've got a waystone on a stick, is the old magic saying, but a waystone on a body. However, with the the AOE damage warlords, you can make sure that you kill this and take the waystone off the board. So the reason that I like Anvir, despite also it's a different ability, right? You're drawing a card and replacing a card in your hand, um, which which is in theory going to help smooth your draws. You you could get I guess it's sort of a 50-50, right? You put back a, a card you don't want, you could draw a card you don't want. Um, but it has the potential to smooth your draw, right? And you're getting the Waystone guaranteed. And I think that's the big takeaway that I would say as to why I would rank him so highly is that when you're able to guarantee a Waystone every single turn that you want to, I feel like that is something we should not overlook. Um, so now let's let's kind of look at the card pools as, as we start with some of these uh, factions, right? So let's get away from Warlord. Um, okay. Uh, let's try and do troops so it's a little less. Okay. So why are Eldar strong, right? They've got some really, obviously they've got some cheap options that are pretty good. Um, you know, having Shuriken on flyers uh, that have flank. Uh, it just the sheer amount of flank cards with um, Eldar make them pretty strong, but a, definitely a standout card is Howling Banshee, right? Like cards like this are just so strong, right? So like turn two, you get your Waystone. Turn three, you can maybe get another Waystone. Um, you play Howling Banshee, you stun something, you hit something, you get like like a three for one where you get to kill two things or soak up two turns of resources and you get your Waystone, right? Um, and you've stunned something. <laughs> it's, it, it, this card is super, super good. Warp Spider, also kind of annoying to deal with. And even cards like Swooping Hawk and uh, Striking Scorpion just net you some really, really crazy value. Uh, Shuriken is just a really nice combat stat to have. Um, and you're getting all these Waystones. Now, why do Waystones matter? Right? So let's go to 7 and 8 and talk about why they matter. Um, I guess we can go a little deeper. So obviously you have legendaries that potentially give you bonus waystones, which is incredibly powerful. Um, but let's just start with some of like one of the best top end cards, Hemlock Wraith Fighter, flying flank blast five, eight range damage for eight energy. And when you have three waystones gets blast five, right? I would say by turn eight, it's pretty easy to get those waystones, right? But being able to guarantee this is just, it's one of the best ways to close out the game and to deal with uh, your opponent's threats. The fact that you get to hit something for eight and you've got eight health and then it blasts out an AoE five, that could hit their Warlord and take out their Vanguard unit. Uh, maybe it just takes out fully three units altogether. 
Um, I mean, obviously that has immense value. So let's let's look at some of the other reasons to play Waystones, right? Um, definitely a card I've heard some frustration over is Eldritch Storm. And I, I, I see why. So it's four energy, deal one to three damage to all enemies. And then if you have two Waystones, it'll repeat the effect. This is just a very strong effect for controlling the board um, at a very reasonable energy rate. Um, and so again, you can just guarantee two waystones by turn four off of your ability with, uh, with Mr. Keltok, um, and just clean up your opponent's board, right? It's a Helldrake strike. For those of you who don't know, that's a, a chaos kind of board sweeper. It's a Helldrake strike for two less that basically has the same power level. So clearly that, that might need to shift, right? So that's, that's one reason that the waystones are very pow powerful. Excuse my scrolling. Uh, Spirit Seer, just really valuable, right? Being able to guarantee two Waystones by turn four. Nets you an extra body. Obviously, that's that's pretty solid as well. Um, yeah, even Vengeful Wraithblade, right? Comes in with, if you've got those two Waystones, it gets armor two and flank. So this thing's a massive kind of uh, Vanguard unit. Uh, and so there's a five drop that is an epic I believe in Necrons. We'll, well, I'm sure we'll get to it. Might be a long video, folks. So strap in. Uh, and so this is essentially that, except it's got plus one power and um, and plus one health, I believe, for the same rate as long as you get those two waystones. So this is what I mean: is like if you can guarantee waystones for Eldar cards, you are you're basically just getting on rate better cards than other factions, right? The caveat is you have to have the waystones. So when you have a warlord that gives you a bunch of spirit stones, you're, you're in the know, right? There, there is infinity circuit. Um, and then there is a really good finisher. I believe it's a stratagem. I don't have it. Host of the dead, spend all of your spirit stones for each one, deploy a wraith guard. It's just incredibly powerful, right? The fact that you can bank Waystones or Spirit Stones the whole time, right? Because I forget, Waystone is the ability, Spirit Stones is what you get. So you bank your Spirit Stones as you're going along, and then you just slam this, and then your opponent has to kill, like deal with all these two threes, right? Wraith Guards. Um, and potentially you just plot, like I, I've played games where, you know, we're going into the late game and my opponent has made seven, eight, nine Wraith Guards off of this card, right? So obviously another huge, huge payoff uh, for your um, Spirit Stones. So I would say in summation, the, the thing that makes Eldar a little less good in certain ways is the fact that you need to make sure you have Spirit Stones. And so to, to kind of close out my, you know, my little, my closing arguments, I guess. Um, oh, it's because of the cost. Whoops. Um, I think Keltok is what you should be doing with Eldar. Now, again, to have that conversation, I think Eldar are the strongest faction uh, because of their card pool. Um, and so I think you can play literally any of these warlords um, and they're going to be good for you. Um, but I do think, like, in terms of sheer power and consistency, to me, Keltok stands out as the best one. And that is why, on our little handy-dandy tier list, we've got Keltok at the top. Um, so, moving right along. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit less, obviously, about uh, all the factions, just as I'm... But I wanted to lay out, kind of, like, the game plan for each one. So now, we've got... Uh, I forget his name, but we move on to the Necrons. Oops. Okay. Why do why do I think Oricon the, the Diviner uh, is the best um, Necron Warlord on on power level and consistency? What does he do? For one energy, you can choose a card from your deck and move it to the top of your deck. So for those who know Sensei's Divining Top, right, uh, which was like a pretty game breaking <laughs> Magic the Gathering card. Uh, that said, you could um, I think. It, was it, it was spend a mana? It was either you spend a mana and look at the top three and rearrange them, and then you have to tap it to put it on top of your library and you draw a card. Um, 
The way I think about it is you get to look at three cards, put the best card on top of your deck. Again, we're, we're seeing kind of parallels, right? Like why Keltok kind of is very in the same wheelhouse as Oricon, right? Because this is making your draws more consistent, right? Um, and But it's allowing you to get the best out of your deck um, for a very, very low cost. And when we talk about the card pool for Necrons, right? Um, we have to talk about Artifice, right? So Artifice is an ability that says whenever you, you play a Stratagem, uh, does something, right? And so a Stratagem is essentially like a spell in, in this game. Um, and this is a spell. So you're, you're playing, you're triggering Artifice potentially every single turn. So let's, let's talk about some of the really, really strong Artifice cards. Um, so scrolling down a little bit here. Sorry, sorry. Okay, Plasmancer, right? Artifice, deal three damage to a random enemy. Obviously pretty strong. Um, we've also got, uh, who, who else is, oh, I guess some of them are actually pretty low cost. Um, artifice, Artifice, where are you guys? Okay, so Tectomancer, God, I, w I wish I had more than <laughs> more than one of these, but I don't, unfortunately. Obviously, being able to reanimate a friendly remnant off of your artifice is insane. This thing has remnant itself. It's really annoying to deal with. Um, we've got artifice here, deploy a canoptic, scarab. Uh, there's basically just a bunch of cards uh, without getting too lost in the sauce here um, that have artifice. And so what Oricon can do is obviously trigger Artifice for the cheapest cost with one one energy um, uh, Warlord ability, right? Lord of the Storm, that costs two, and uh, the Relentless March also costs two. And in my mind, I think that Necron typically play more towards mid-range or control. They've got some really, really powerful late-game cards, abilities to reduce the cost of troops in your deck, like you, you have all these like late game synergy things. So what Oricon does, although he, he doesn't have the plus five health that Imatech has, right? You're just smoothing out your draws, finding the answers that you need, finding the, the units that you need off of his ability. And then you're getting a bonus every time you do it when you have a card that has Artemis that, that triggers. So to me, again, I think out of these three Warlords, what Oricon is doing is just strictly better and more consistent than his other two counterparts. Um, it really very similar comparison, I would say, to the Eldar. Um, and so I think I just put him up there because uh, even if you don't have the optimal Necron build, he just makes your deck more smooth um, from, you know, from his ability. Um, and then when you're like really min-maxing and you've got like all the cards you kind of want, um, I do think that He's incredibly strong. Um, and so that's why he is in the top two. The extremely good or like S tier, I, I put these two. And I really did put a lot of thought into this. And I'm sure some folks are going to disagree. Um, but with my kind of power consistency angle, you know, this generally has served me pretty well when I've been analyzing metas for other games. And so I feel pretty good about those. Um, I'm sure as we get towards the bottom, I'm going to take less time. But... Um, we definitely need to kind of lay out the arguments. So really quickly, and yes, we're going to talk about Ultramarines a little bit more. Um, we've got both uh, Eliac Zephyr Blade and Magnus Kalgar kind of right next to each other. And I could have put them down here in the carried by the card pool bad by itself. It's hard for me to say, like, I don't, I don't really want to label it that way because they, so one is a combat based stratagem. The other is complete, literally just draw a card. Um, I think drawing a card most of the time is probably going to be better than a combat-based uh, Warlord ability. Just because in a vacuum, would you rather have card advantage or would you rather deal like plus one damage? Like at, like at the floor, right? The floor of drawing a card is a lot higher than I get to deal three damage to your Warlord um, and I take two damage. So um, I should, yeah, so I should actually... <laughs> Magnus up here um, and the reason he's kind of above all of these but we've got all we've got 340 health um, warlords here is that 
plus five health makes much more of a difference than you would think. Um, it just means that the math has to shift. And like, whereas you'd be able to rush down certain opponents or really pressure their life total uh, in a way that, you know, is pretty effective, it's just less effective for these warlords. So let's, let's get into Magnus and kind of why he's there. Magnus, don't have him. But let me tell you, I played against a player who has a like really, really fine-tuned um, Magnus Calgar control deck. And uh, generally, I think the 40 health kind of kind of makes you want to go more control, right? You've got the aggro option, the sort of mid-range option, and the control option. Um, and I do think that I would probably play Magnus over Tigurius, but I also really like Tigurius' play style. Um, and I and I has kind of been my my pet project for a little while, so I'll definitely have a video out on that soon. So why is why do I feel Magnus is a little bit carried by his card pool? Um, I generally think that Ultramarines are pretty strong across the board. Um, but let's talk about, I think, a few uh, key cards because I think that just gives folks, especially who have not played this game as much as I have, uh, a bit of an idea of where we're going. So first off, Octavio Infiltrator. I only have one. God, I wish I had two. This card is so, so good. There are just so many ways to take advantage of blinding an enemy. And the fact that you can pay one and basically, you're never going to like just play this out, like run this out in the early game. What you're going to do is you're going to have it sitting in your hand. Um, and it's particularly good against Eldar, because Eldar are very good with their vehicles and their flying and their ranged attack uh, to be able to blind something and just kill it for free. Um, it's just, th this is like a linchpin for me um, in the Space Marines, you know, Ultramarines uh, play style. And I think that it is just a really, really key card for, um, and powerful overall. So let's do a little bit. Of so the other, so two commonalities between Ultramarines and Eldar is that both have access to like a slew of flank cards. And what flank essentially says is, uh, I'm going to play this to trade with the unit, which is like, eh, whatever. But also sometimes you get to trade up. Um, and also sometimes you get a two for one, right? So if they happen to have like a little Termagant, because I'm playing against uh, Ultramarines. So I'm playing against Tyranids. I get to play Primaris Reaver, beat their guy, and then they have to attack my guy to take it off the board. Um, so we've got Primaris Reaver. That does that pretty well. We've also got Primaris Interceptor, which does it very well. Uh, this, this thing does a ton of work, especially when you're blinding enemies. Being able to deal four on three energy with three health is nothing to sneeze at. And then there's the six drop uh, Interceptor, sergeant which is six uh flank damage you know coming in um and six health and i just basically like either as control or mid-range having the access to these flank cards just means like you get to decide when you want to play them out right you just they're sitting in your hand and you're like okay great i can i can kill that one for one or you're like oh i can actually get a two for one out of this sweet i'm going to trade up for that um so I, I think flank cards make Ultramarines like have a pretty nice uh, power level already. So let's let's talk about some of the other uh, key cards. Okay, Armored Support. Uh, I've got seven of these bad boys. We only need two though. Um, I've said this in multiple games or CCGs in particular. When you're able to draft cards outside of your collection, it's obviously going to be good. Armored support, essentially like 50% of the time, is going to give you uh, the ability to get Redemptor Dreadnought. I believe that's the one with the, the assault gun. Um, or uh, or get the Repulsor, the, the big tank, the 10 cost. Or, you know, another option is, is pretty good, is the, um, the like little transport unit that makes tutus. Um, so th this card, I just think, Maybe not in the aggro deck, but honestly, I've tried it and I think I like it. This card is just like probably what you're doing on turn three. Um, and uh, I started by saying I played against a mean Magnus Calgar uh, control deck. When they're just able to have that plus five health, they're getting card advantage. They're never going to run out of gas. And then what's really important is that the vehicle then costs two less permanently. You can play a Redemptor Dreadnought instead of turn eight, turn six instead of a repulsor on turn 10, turn eight, right? Or like eight energy. 
um, it makes a huge difference. I mean, bumping it up by one would be fine. Bumping it up by two, I think, actively makes this card good. So that's a reason why Space Marines are pretty strong. Um, I don't have either of these, but I'm really excited to play them. Uh, Cronus, you know, being able to deploy a vehicle, giving it flank, obviously pretty strong ability. Necrons have a similar guy. I think he's on five energy that gives all units uh, flank when they come into play. Spear McCrag's kind of nice too, like being able to give something armor to. And Vanguard is definitely, uh, you know, nothing to sneeze at. The unit's good itself. Death from above. When I played against this Magnus Calgar player, um, they're, you know, they basically are stabilizing. And then at some point you turn the corner with your Redemptor Dreadnought and some of your other like Vanguard cards. And then if you're just running two Death from above in your deck and you're drawing cards with Magnus's ability, it's just such, it helps your reach. And you're just able to, you know, really stabilize against your opponent and then close out the game, I think, with Death from above. So I'm, uh, I'm really excited to play that card when I get it. Um, Primaris Chaplain, so I've played against it, and I've played with it when I've drafted. Um, I mean, it's it's nice, like, uh, you know, triggering Codex every turn, you can get plus one melee, plus one ranged. It does kind of imply that you're playing troops every turn, right? I think Primaris Chaplain probably makes a little bit more sense in Uriel or Tigurius. Probably Uriel, though, if you're trying to kind of have more of this aggressive bent to what you're doing, I think you're going to get more out of this ability, uh, but still definitely a pretty solid rate for what you're getting. Let's take away the threes and fours. Um, Inspired Retribution. This card, uh, just to kind of, you know, be closing out as to why I think Ultramarines are strong, Unconditional Removal is extremely powerful from, from my perspective. There are just so many cards that are really hard to answer through just only combat-based uh, abilities and just playing inspired retribution i love it in tigurius like because you have that you can pay two energy to draw a stratagem from your deck and have a higher chance of hitting your inspired retribution um this card's great uh and then these these are two key cards i'm still kind of feeling out sergeant tellian but i do think he's pretty strong uh primaris impulsor excellent excellent card five energy five health four ranged when you play it you codex you get a 2-2 that has 3 health. Sometimes you just turn the corner. You play this turn 5. Um, and then you just keep... You like get 2 or 3 Primaris Intercessors out of it. You've got like a whole board from like one card. It gets really crazy. And a card that I cannot wait to play when I have it is Primaris just, just this year. Um, 5 energy, 6 health, Vanguard... Six attack, two, it's, you know, very, uh, very typical stats, I would say, for, for some of the five drop Vanguard cards. But its codex is stun a random enemy, right? Which also inc includes their warlord. I found that when you only can stun enemy units, it's obviously strictly worse. Um, this card just seems like such a linchpin in the mid range and control uh, Ultramarines decks. And I think it's just an excellent, excellent card. So that's, that's kind of why I also think. That Space Marines have a pretty good power level. Oh, sorry. Did I take the... No, okay. It's showing the cards I don't have to. Um, and then real quick to speak about some of the top end. I don't think Librarian's great. I definitely don't think Captain Sicarius is great. Uh, they just... It doesn't matter that they have a bunch of health and a bunch of stats. Like, we've got unconditional removal in this game. They're not doing enough. But cards that are definitely pulling their weight in the late game are Redemptor Dreadnought which is Codex 1 to 2 damage to all enemies. It's got a whopping 8 range. When you play this thing on turn 6 against your opponent, it's it does so much. Like, unless you're in the mirror match or you're playing against other factions that have unconditional removal, this thing just is a house. Same thing with Repulsor Executioner. Um, deal 8 damage to something when it comes into play, right? Like, the theme is the cards that are good have rally abilities or they have flank. Uh, in a lot of cases. Um, or Artifice, right? It's like something that they can do almost immediately when they come into play. This thing is obviously, it's a house, it's a tank. Um, it's a real problem for your opponent when you resolve it. Uh, and it stays alive. So that's that's kind of why I think Magnus is, is sort of carried, if you will, um, by his card pool. 
Um, I don't know that just drawing a straight up card is technically good enough. It's certainly not bad. Certainly not bad. Obviously a good option. But like, I really like Varro because um, you just get, you get three really unique and interesting options. You can either draw just a stratagem, so it's strictly worse than Calgar, right? Because you can draw any card with, with Calgar. But, um, but you can kind of tune your deck in an interesting way. But the other abilities that Targaryens have is like if you need an extra one damage, you can minimum get that. And you can put sh a shield on a unit, which I actually think is a pretty strong ability. Um, but I think Calgar getting gets the nod as the top Ultramarines uh, Warlord because of the plus five health and because that plus five health combined with drawing a card most turns when you need to um, just ends up putting them a bit over the top. Um, and so I'm not going to say too much about Eliak here just because we've kind of laid out the, the plan with the, the old Eldar, but having the plus 40 health, um, he obviously has a bit more of an aggressive bent because you, he gives himself shuriken one, right? Um, oh, you can also give it to a friendly vehicle. I'm not going to lie. I don't know if I knew that. That's, that's actually a nice option to have. So you, you can, uh, potentially give one of your vehicles that already has like shuriken two or three, um, an even better bet of, of, uh, freely killing something. Um, Eliak is, I, I'd say, I would say is kind of carried by his card pool on, on face. I don't think that his ability is incredibly strong. I would probably take Madrail's ability over him. Um, but the plus five health just means you've got five more health to work with. It's harder to rush you down. Eldar already have very good late game. Uh, a lot of really great ways to control the board. But again, I, I don't think that he is better than uh, Keltok. I, I think Keltok gets the nod there. So that's why we're putting him here. So let's talk about Emotek, um, who is the last uh, 40 health of the top, the kind of the top factions that we're talking about. Um, Emotek, what does he do? He deals one damage to an enemy and heals one to your warlord. Don't make the mistake of playing this on turn one before you've attacked. <laughs> you need to attack in order to heal. You're not gaining, you're not getting plus two health, you're gaining one health. So there, there is a difference. Um, so needless to say, we went through some of the Necron card pool. Emotech is going to be, get the nod a little bit more than Nemezer because the plus five health just allows you to go more in the control route. Necrons have really great late game, in my opinion. Um, you're going to hear me say that a lot. I, and, and I will talk a little bit closer about like which I think is the best late game. Um, and I would just say, I think as things currently stand, I think Eldar enable that better. Probably goes like Eldar, Necron, then Ultramarine in my mind. Um, but yeah, Im Imatech, again, like just enables more of a late game strategy. Um, and when we're thinking about power and consistency, these Warlords definitely have it, right? So we've got two Eldar, two Necron, Ultramarine. So I think Madrell... Um, I, I put up here because although her ability is like not that crazy good, her card pool is. Um, and if you don't manage her well, she will overwhelm you. Um, and, and those those little dudes at two energy, they do they do add up. So let me talk about um, two kind of pet favorites. I put up a Neurothrope video already. I'll be putting up one for uh, our boy Tigurius. So let's go to Tigurius real quick. Okay. I kind of talked about why I like this card. I like the modality of him. Uh, I like his kind of mid-range strategy. I like the sort of deck building strategy where because you have, uh, you can guarantee draw a stratagem every single turn. Um, I have kind of liked, uh, you know, constructing decks with, with that in mind. Um, and so, you know, to me, he feels kind of more mid-range. Uh, you know, if he had plus five health, I think I'd, probably take him over Magnus Calgar. Uh, the modality of getting a shield on target unit, um, needing an extra damage or up to three damage, or drawing a stratagem is pretty good. Um, and I just generally think that because Ultramarines have some really, really great um, cards like for power level and like the floor of them, uh, I really like Tigorius. So that's kind of where I'm at with him. Um, so the reason I put Neurothrope, I think I have him as the top, yeah, the top tier in it. Um, some people might disagree. I know there have been some really crazy cool Turvagon builds and Swarmlord, um, you know, kind of 
implied having 40 health and attacking for three could be quite aggressive and strong. Um, but uh, but let's think about what uh, what some of these Tyranid builds struggle with, and that is ranged attackers, right? Swarmlord does not help you deal with that, right? Like, yes, it can give plus one melee ranged in health. Like, this is a powerful card. It's obviously pretty good, uh, or very good, with Synapse cards. Um, but I'm thinking in terms of like his the, his like ability essentially is that he attacks for three but he only attacks back for one unranged. And he's got 40 health. These are pretty close. I think Turvagon is definitely the bottom of the barrel when it comes to Tyranids, in my mind. Um, but the reason I like Neurothrope is because I, I really do think this ability is extremely good. Um, because it's one... I, I've been really thinking about how big of a deal is it when something is one energy versus two. And I just think the answer is it's a big deal. Having something cost one energy less is a big deal. It sets up your draws in ways that, you know, you're a little bit more mana clogged in, in for a two energy card. And Spirit Leech does exactly what your Synapse cards want, right? So let's let's look at that real quick. So we've got Spore Assist with Synapse and Artifice. This does a ton of work. It basically builds a board by itself. Tyranid Prime. Synapse, uh, whenever you're swarming, right, you're getting value. Um, let's see, what else do we got? And then we've got two cards that I'm missing, unfortunately, that would make my, <laughs> my uh, Neurothrope deck a hell of a lot better. Zoanthrope, Synapse, deals one to three damage to a random enemy. Broodlord, it's got stealth. This thing is such a monster. Um, and then whenever you Synapse, you trigger it twice. These cards are so, so strong. Um, and for those of you who didn't see my Tyranid video, uh, the reason that I really like Neurothrope in general as well is because the, or, or just like Tyranids in, in general, is the, their counterattack card, which reduces a unit you play by two energy for zero energy, right? Um, and what this allows you to do is play a four drop on turn one, and then next turn, Right, you start. You just spam Spirit Leech every single turn, and you've got access to multiple four drops that have Synapse, right? And so what this reads is, it's it seems kind of weak, right? It's deal one damage or give plus one health to a friendly unit. But what this really says with Synapse is, um, give th two to three units, including your Warlord, plus one health for one energy, um, and it, it might not seem like a lot. But when you're spamming this ability every single turn and you're like building this board and you've also got access to a really good four drop Vanguard unit um, and other synergies where you have a cheap, cheap card that can trigger um, Synapse, you just run away with the game. Um, and I just think that it's more consistent than what Swarm Lord is doing. That's that's all, kind of why I put it above it. Um, and so, you know, let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, I played a good bit of... Tyranids just because I do have the Neurothrope and I was really excited to. Um, and I do think that Neurothrope gets a little bit more of the nod over uh, Swarm Lord. And that's that's why I put it up there. So that is S tier and A tier. Um, again, I'm going to say like all of these Warlords obviously can win games. Uh, it's going to be a little bit clearer as we get toward the bottom why orcs kind of stand out as probably like the least powerful least consistent faction in my mind um even with some like interesting builds that i've seen uh although there's one that makes it into the b tier uh but yeah i think i think if you're starting with any of these right and so like you start out with madrail which is pretty good um the rest of these you have to get um but i think you know, when you hit them, I think you're going to see like how the power level kind of changes uh, as opposed to the starter ones that you get. So speaking of starter, we've got some starters in here, right? We've got starter for Necrons, starter for Ultramarines, starter for Orcs, starter for Chaos, starter for Tyranid, right? So um, clearly they're, they, they're kind of like, there is a bit of a hierarchy and they made these different Warlords, I'm sure with kind of a, a similar sort of tiered uh, 
idea in mind right that's why some are epic some are legendary like there's kind of that implication that some of them are more powerful than others um but i think what nemezer and uriel both do is uh just do they do something fine for two energy nemezer makes a um a you know remnant uh unit and then uriel just does one damage to three different units and honestly is a lot more powerful than you might think um and i would say kind of the more unique um, and I think has some really great power to him is Gruk. So let's, let's go over the, the little old orcs. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll kind of talk about my thought process here for, for how I prioritize the orcs. So boss kind of stands out as the aggressive, uh, warlord, right? So his ability is he gets plus one melee attack and plus one armor and flying. So essentially what this says is pay to my cat's gonna come into the frame now yep just you just gotta stretch right here huh um wake up from a nap just stretch just sit on the keyboard this is yep you're just fully stretching on okay on my hand thank you um could, couldn't have a video without a cat so uh boss extract clearly having more of an aggressive bent i just don't think that the orc kind of aggro strategy is that good i don't really think it pans out the way we would want it to right um let's look at some of the units right so bomb squig this thing is kind of like counterintuitive to curving out right it's more of like a mid-range or kind of like control uh ability right because it's going to die and then deal damage to um all enemies but it has backlash right or like unstable so it's also going to deal damage to adjacent units so this doesn't really make sense obviously in an aggro strategy um i guess i have to give her some attention now um slug boy does right but you don't want to play this on turn one you want to play it on on when you have four energy so you get the value the card advantage um storm boy is like fine but just like three health it's not trading back on range very well. That's not very good. Same with Truck Boy. Um, and then, like, Hornheim Boys, okay, you pack a little bit of a punch, but you've only got three health. Um, you've got some of these kind of vehicle synergies with Spanner. I think Shoot a Boy, we'll talk about, like, is, like, a pretty excellent card. Um, but if you're just looking at the stats of these cards, like, I think, aside from some of the combos, when you're comparing it to um, other, other factions... To me, it's just, there's no contest. It just doesn't feel like orcs are kind of curving out. Like Storm Boy Strike is interesting, right? You get a bunch of Storm Boys. They also kind of have a little bit of a control bent with like stuff like Will of the Gork. Um, Mega Knob can be pretty good. Veteran Storm Boy can be pretty good. Same with Ardshell Gurk. Um, so it just, to me, I think if you're trying to do this kind of like aggressive strategy, I just, I don't think that's the way to build orcs oddly like or oddly or maybe not oddly enough um i think that they're with gaskol and grook and i'm picking grook over gaskol and talk about why um i think they bend more towards like this kind of like combo control ish sort of setup y play style um so why do i think grook is better than gaskol gaskol has more health and he's got a great ability right just permanently give all troops plus one melee and range attack um, Grook, however, does something similar, but slightly better, right? Oh my, you just, you're, you just need so much attention as I'm recording this, of course. So why I like Deredwa, right, is that you get to draw a troop and it gets plus one melee attack. So you're getting kind of half of what the other guy's ability is, right? It gets plus one melee attack, but you're also just ripping a unit out of your deck. Why is that better than Gazcall? Tell you right now. It depends on some very specific stratagems. The big one being the Green Horde, right? Uh, for those who hadn't really seen my video on orcs, this is kind of the linchpin combo orc go wide strategy. Basically, you, you're ideally waiting till turn five to play the Green Horde, dump a bunch of guys on, your, on the battlefield. You spent two to three turns ripping units out of your deck with your Warlord that are even a little bit buffed. And then you've got Arda's Nails at two energy to give all your units plus two health. 
I really think that this is a pretty good strategy for orcs and why I would pick it um, over some of the other strategies. Also, I was lucky enough to get Prophet of the Wall, right? So choose a stratagem from your deck, draw it. You can just reduce the number of stratagems in your deck to increase the chance that you draw the Green Horde. Um, and so I think that's kind of how you want to play them. And the reason I think Gruk is better is because you're ripping those units out of your deck. So giving you a higher chance of being able to draw the stratagems that you need. And also you're filling your hand for the Green Horde, right? You're not having to play units to then set up what your Warlord is doing. So that's why I think that um, out of the Warlords, Gruk as the starter is actually the strongest one for what the Orcs are trying to do. Um, but who knows? Like, obviously, when I get Gaskal, I want to test him more. I honestly haven't seen him much on the ladder. Maybe that's an indication that he's not that good. Um, I really think Gruk just has a bit more going for him for what the Orcs are really able to do. Um, the reason he's in B tier is because you have consistency issues. You can make your deck more and more consistent with Gruk, but it just isn't... You know, I can't say uh, that it's a guarantee, right? I just can't say that. Um, and so I, I think he is really interesting to talk about. Now, you'll notice something uh, in terms of like what could be some of the like lesser powered factions. We've got three orcs kind of at the bottom here. <laughs> We've also got three chaos and two tyranid. So if you're thinking about, hey, Tim, what do I think are the top three factions? Just, just look here, right? We've got a bunch. We've got three Eldars in the top two tiers. We've got two Necron in the top two tiers. We've got two Ultramarine in the top two tiers. So, just odds are, uh, you know, these these three factions are probably strongest. Um, that's just kind of, you know, my my take on that so far. So let's talk about chaos because uh, our boys haven't gotten a lot of love, and I think there are a couple of reasons why. Harkin, I like as a starter, but I think uh, his ability is actually just a little too narrow. Like, yes, it's nice to be able to have some level of board control, but it's just probably not as good as like drawing a card or getting a mark of chaos. Um, and chaos's kind of play style, for the most part, is going tall, right? Meaning you're putting a bunch of marks of chaos on something and just kind of going to town with that. So both Silar and Abaddon do that you can pay two to either put uh choose a mark of chaos to give up to someone or abaddon it's random right gives a random mark of chaos abaddon has plus five health so that's probably how they balanced it by making this random and silar you actually get to choose it so some key cards and synergies when we're looking at chaos and why they might just not be as good um is that it all it all revolves around marks of chaos chaos legendary probably the best two drop Obviously, very good card. I don't have it, sadly. You've got Chaos Sergeant to kind of set things up. You've got Rubric Marine, which has some extremely good synergy. With drawing a card, it gets marks. You use other cards that you draw cards when they have marks. And it kind of combos off, right? So for the most part, you've got Dark Oratory, right? Give a mark of chaos to all your troops. Um, it's just your... And, and then with Corn, Noise Marine, and Plague Marine, it all revolves around, like, if something's dying, you get a mark. Or if something's taking damage, you're getting a mark, right? Gift of Chaos, also really, really good. Give two random marks to a friendly troop. Skeens of Fate is one of the best combos, right? Give something stealth, so they can't really interact with it. Draw a card for each mark on it, right? And for uh, the uh, Rubric Marine, it gets the Zinch marks. Um, I realized, I learned recently that that's how that's pronounced. Um, and whenever you draw a card, it gets more marks. So it just kind of feeds itself. And then you've got some, you know, pretty good late game cards. You've got Helldrake Strike. Um, also, Venom Crawler can be like pretty potent for trying to set you up. Um, what else is, stands out? Um, obviously, Chaos Lord. If you play it and it doesn't die, that's pretty good. But let's look at. I think it's five and four drops kind of stand out a bit. Um, Warp Talon with Marks of Chaos can be pretty scary. Possessed Champion. Um, also, Child of Torment can kind of go off. Lorvi and Urkris, I haven't seen this play. This thing seems really nasty. Uh, getting double marks of corn. Uh, Master of Possession, just really good card advantage, right? And kind of beefy. 
Um, you can also have Master of Execution to deal a lot of damage. Um, so, and and then Aspiring Champion, I really, really liked uh, comboing with Marks of Chaos. So, really, what I think about uh, the Chaos Marines is that generally their cards are seem less powerful than Ultramarines if we're kind of just comparing those two. Um, but they can be insane if you combo properly. So I just think generally they're a bit unstable or not consistent. Um, and I, that's kind of why I think they're at the bottom of the barrel. And if you have any interaction, they get really hamstrung by that. Right, unless they're giving their really important units right at the right time stealth, odds are with flank cards with unconditional removal, you can just beat them out. So I just think that they definitely need more pieces at the like common and like rare level, whether they're units or stratagems, and I would say probably units that just have a bit more bang for your buck um, to be as consistent as some of the other factions. So I think Abaddon is the best because he's got more health. Therefore, if it's less, if your decks are less consistent and take more setup, like uh, that's just how I feel about Chaos Marines. I think they require a lot of setup. Oh, she's leaving now. Wow. Okay. Um, sorry if I was distracted. Um, I think that Abaddon's probably just where you want to be. And then I think kind of briefly followed by Sylar, who's probably just a little bit better in terms of modality than what Harkin's offering. And then I talked about Swarmlord and Turvagon. I think I probably would take Swarmlord over Turvagon. I think Turvagon can have some combo properties, but if we're talking about consistency and power, I think Swarmlord takes it. Whew. Okay, we're down to the last two, and I already kind of talked about it. Um, they just, I think, I think he is actively bad. I'm sure Gazcall can like kind of work, but like, I'm not going to put him in B because honestly, I think the most playable orc deck is Grook. Um, and then I didn't really use this, this last category. Um, some of this I'm sure will probably shift obviously as like we move into, um, not only like new cards in the future, but like balance changes. Um, and also just like, you know, caveat here, right? Take, take my opinion with a grain of salt. I don't have all the warlords, right? I've only played against them or with them. And that's kind of how I'm forming my opinions or playing with the card pools and thinking, oh, would this warlord enable a better strategy? Um, so that's what I have for you today, folks. Um, we're looking at all these warlords. There's plenty to choose from. Um, there's plenty that you start out with, right? You start out with one from each faction. I'm still missing quite a lot. If we go to filters, right? Yeah, I've got... Eight. Yeah, I have nine, uh, nine of them. So I'm definitely missing quite a few. Um, but you know, we're getting there. We've got uh, two for Ultramarine, two for Orc, two for Tyranid, and then we're missing quite a few. Uh, but I, I hope y'all enjoyed this video. Again, I'll flip back to the tier list. Sorry, it's a little small, um, but I'm sure you can pause at different points and I'll have the time codes and all that good stuff. I hope this was helpful just for kind of thinking about all the warlords that we've gotten access to. Um, let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, definitely, you know, show some support if you really enjoyed it with the likes and the subscribes. Um, you bet that when this game comes out and we're fully rolling, and I, I really just, I'm so excited to be out of alpha. I want to craft cards. I want to build my collection. I don't want it to reset, which it's going to at the end of the alpha. Um, I'm just ready. I'm ready for the next phase of this game. Uh, even though I still want to build out my collection as, as we're getting to play with more Warlords. Um, that was a long way of saying, you bet I will have tier lists as often as I can because it's one of my favorite things to talk about um, because I think it's helpful for new players and I think it's an interesting conversation for players who are playing at the same level. Um, so uh, that's all I got for you today. Probably a long video. Thanks for sticking with it. And uh, I'll catch you next time. Thanks.